Welcome, everyone. I am Mariana Matsukato. I'm the director of the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, which is collaborating with the British Library on this wonderful series, which hopefully you all have a brochure on, called Rethinking Public Value and Public Purpose in 21st Century Capitalism. IAPP is a UCL institute. It's actually a department, so we have our own teaching program trying to bring back this concept of public value to the center of economic thinking. You'd think that that word even existed in economics. Unfortunately, it doesn't. We have words like public goods, but they're really narrow words that have actually strangely been used to delimit the areas where public policy is allowed to tread. Just think of the BBC when it's told it's crowding out uh, private broadcasters, so at best it's allowed to do documentaries about giraffes in Africa, but how dare it do soap operas and talk shows? That's for business. And so the word public value that we're trying to revive is really a much more cross-cutting concept of how you actively co-create and co-shape the markets of the future, as opposed to just fixing market failures in existing defined markets that can be extremely problematic. Uh, we have about seven new lectures still to go. Uh, the whole lecture series is trying actually to bring designers, architects, musicians, and of course economists uh, to think about this concept together, including you know, just because an area is free to access, does it actually mean it's public? Just because Google is free, does it mean it's really public? So how do we create proper public realms through public-private partnerships? How do we really engage in a not tokenistic way, civil society in that uh, endeavor? And that brings me to tonight's lecture. We are extremely proud and happy to have Stephanie with us. She's actually on the advisory board of the Institute. We had a very interesting discussion today about what it means to have a mission-oriented type of economic policy. Um, but Stephanie is the professor of public policy and economics at Stony Brook University. And previously, she was the chief economist of the US Senate Budget Committee and a senior advisor to Bernie Sanders himself. And I think she'll be reflecting on that experience tonight. She was the founder and editor-in-chief of the top-ranked blog, New Economic Perspectives, and a member of the Top Wonks Network of the Nation's Best Thinkers. In 2016, Politico, I said that like an Italian, Politico recognized her as one of the 50 people across the country, the US, um, that is most influencing the political debate. And her book, The State, the Market, and the Euro, published in 2001, actually predicted the debt crisis, which was much more than just a debt crisis, an economic crisis, in the Eurozone and elsewhere. And her subsequent work correctly predicted that, first of all, quantitative easing wouldn't lead to high inflation, and two, that government deficits wouldn't cause a spike in US interest rates. Um, and three, God, these are very carefully written notes by PhD students, that the S&P downgrade wouldn't cost investors to flee the treasuries, and four, that the US would not experience a European-style debt crisis. <laughs> Instead, a whole other mess of things happened, which she also predicted. Anyway, so this is enough for me, and all I can say is that this is an incredibly important uh, lecture tonight because actually thinking about what do we mean by a public budget, how it's different from a, a family budget, which of course is constrained by certain factors, will hopefully also allow us to really think about that topic that we talked about today in the advisory board, which is let's actually think about what we want to be investing in, the kind of results, the missions, the outputs that we want to create in the economy, and then let's just create the budget to get us there versus the reverse. Here's your limited budget, and within that, think in a very narrow way what you can do. So Stephanie, thank you so much for coming all the way from the US for tonight's event, and we're all extremely excited to, to have you. Well, thank you very much. She's, um, it was a bit of a spoiler. So uh, I'm going to try to fill in some gaps because you nailed it in terms of, no, no, not in a bad way, in a good way, in a good set up way. The way a good introduction goes, you let them know what this is, what the speaker is going to come and do. And that's exactly what I'm going to come and do. So if I um, had to characterize the way that I approach economics, I guess it is um, fair to say that I am somewhat of a contrarian. Um, if I'm here today to tell you that when it comes to the British government, money is no object. Imagine the space that that opens up when Mariana talks about not taking a fixed allocation of 
of pounds and saying, this is your budget, go see what you can do with it, if instead you were told, what is it you would like to do? What kind of an economy would you like to build? Right? What are the missions you are trying to achieve in the economy? What is the budget you need to carry out those missions? And you could fit the budget to those goals. What would that look like? Could we even do that? Is that even realistic? I think it's fair to say that both here and in the US and across Europe and mostly around the world, we do it the other way around, right? We start with the notion that money is in fact an object. And that's why we hear politicians talk about the need to find the money, right? How are you going to find the money? You wanna build infrastructure? You wanna do healthcare? You wanna do education? Where are you going to get the money, right? Finding the money becomes a really critical, it's at the starting point. You don't leave the starting gate until you answer the critical question, how will you pay for it? Where will the money come from? And my position is that this traps us unnecessarily, and it traps us in a frame of mind where we're all basically walking around as if we're still operating on a gold standard. Because that's what it means to say, find the money. It's like there's something out there. It's money. It exists. Where is it? Who has it? How much of it is there? And how much of it can you extract via taxes, borrowing? How much can you raise to get revenue to finance whatever it is the government is trying to carry out? So I'm going to start with the premise that that is wrong. Okay, and I will try, I will recognize the grimaces in the audience that not all of you are with me, maybe yet, but I hope to persuade you to, if you're not already uh, thinking along these lines, that we ought to be thinking along these lines, that there's far greater space available to countries like the US and like the UK in terms of the policy space, the options that are available, the resources that are out there that could be mobilized and put to public use, right, to serve the public public good, and, and that the money piece is what stands in the way. And part of what is attached to the money piece is the idea that deficits are a problem. Okay, so we got the money piece, we have to deal with myths about where the money will come from, how to pay for things, and then we have the deficit piece, the idea that if you don't fully pay for things, that is, if you don't raise enough revenue via taxation and you have to borrow, you're somehow putting the nation at risk solvency risks, vulnerabilities with respect to the bond markets, burdening next generations. We all know the stories, right? You've all heard them, am I correct? Yeah, so we're bombarded with this stuff on a daily basis. Everybody tells us this is the reason we can't have nice things, because of the national debt, because of the budget deficit, because of the need to pay for things. So I'm gonna do my best in a limited period of time to disabuse us of some of this rhetoric, okay? So this is where we are. This is how we start our thinking. And this is the flaw, right? Right from the beginning, we begin with a flawed premise. And the flawed premise is that somehow the federal government has to play by the same set of rules as you and I, okay? The government is really just like a giant household and it must manage its finances in a responsible way, just the way that you and I must manage our finances. So you look at a family budget and you say, okay, what is it that comes in every month or on an annual basis? What are the expenses? What's the outgo? And then how do we match the two so that we avoid doing what? Ending up in the red, right? Ending up with deficits. The goal being to adjust your expenditures so you know what the income is. You have a salary. I know what my budget constraint is. It's my income. What can I afford? What car payment can I afford? What is the rent or the mortgage I can afford? How much can I afford for my cable bill? And you go down through the list of expenses and you fit your expenses to the budget. If you can't afford it, it doesn't become one of your expenses. If things get too tight, what do you do? You oh, well, <laughs> borrow, because I'm not giving up my standard of living. I, I may borrow or I may say, I've got I've to make cuts. Right, so the nanny is a luxury and I've got to take her down from five days a week to three days a week. And the housekeeper goes to every other week instead of coming every week. And I trim my expenses where I can and I can more or less balance my own budget, right? I can manage my expenses, try to avoid going into debt, at least that's the idea, right? Avoid going into debt and build up some kind of savings over time 
accumulate savings, build wealth so that you have a cushion, right, for later on in life. So obviously, this makes perfectly good sense for you and I to behave this way. There's, I don't see any problem with this at all, right? This is rational stuff. What happens, though, when households get frugal? Like, think of austerity at the household level, okay? You're trying to manage your expenses, so you start cutting some of your expenditures, tightening your budget. You know, you don't have a lot of room on the income side. You don't just go up to the boss and say, it's getting a little tight. Uh, I was wondering if you could just, you know, bump up my salary a little bit so I have a little more cushion. Not really. You know, you're forced to deal on the spending side. So you start trimming expenditures. And at the individual level, this can work. I can save more by spending less. I can pay down my debt. I can accumulate savings. And for me as an individual, this can work out. Right? The problem is if everyone in the economy attempts to behave this way at the same time. Now, why is it that what's good for the individual is catastrophic for the economy as a whole, if everybody tries to do it? How does it make sense that doing something sensible becomes a disaster if everybody practices that behavior? Keynes called it the paradox of thrift, right? It's a fallacy of composition. It's when we try to apply something that works at the micro level to the macro level. And what happens is this. Capitalism, our market economy, runs on sales. Cap this is the easiest way I have found to describe the way that the economy works. It runs on sales. Okay, the economy as a whole is organized around production for profit. Firms hire workers because they expect that if they hire the worker, and incur the costs of paying the wage and benefits of that worker, that that worker is going to help the firm produce some output, which that firm can turn around and sell for more than the cost of production. That is, that they can turn a profit, right? That's why businesses hire and invest, because they think it will be profitable. So what you have happening in the economy as a whole are loads of firms in the US millions here, maybe tens and tens of thousands of firms basically picture them stocking a giant conveyor belt. Everyone is producing and adding some output for sale, like wanting, the goal being, please be a customer on the other end of this, right? I'm producing, I want someone to buy this. So all of this merchandise, the idea is to offload it, to find demand for that output. Households carry most of the weight. They offload most of the product, which is to say that household consumption is most of GDP. Most of the spending that takes place in the economy is done by households. People sometimes think it's government spending, right? Because everyone is always telling me government is so big and such a big part of the economy. Government does a small amount of the total spending. The vast majority is done by the household sector. So households are pulling boxes off of this conveyor belt. They're buying output. But what happens when they decide to tighten their belts? What happens when they decide to spend less in order to try to save more, to be responsible fiscally with their budget. What happens? Some of that stuff doesn't get sold. Okay? Some of that stuff doesn't get sold. So the conveyor belt's going around and now it's carrying more merchandise, it's carrying more merchandise. And what happens? Firms say, uh-oh, we have a problem. There's no demand for the level of production that I'm currently at. I have to scale back. So I lay off some workers, right? The rising inventory is the signal to the firm. You're producing too much stuff, nobody wants this. Right? The demand falls and unemployment goes up. So unemployment rises, firms scale back. This is what happened in the last recession for the US. I don't have a graph that looks exactly like this for the UK, but it would look very similar to this. Okay, so in the old days, and by the old days I mean you know, post-World War II, capitalist economies all go through business cycles. No nation on earth has ever eliminated the business cycle. We all have booms and they're followed by busts and then they have another boom and you have a bust, okay? In the old days, we used to have a shorter business cycle. We used to call them V-shaped recoveries because the economy would turn down but it would recover pretty quickly. And so you would get this V-shaped sort of pattern the early recessions, but then something starts to change around the 1980s. The recessions begin to stretch out. Look at the 81 recession. And then the 90 recession is the black. And the 2001 recession is the brown. And the last one is the red. We have become more and more U-shaped, and the U's are beginning to look more like L's 
in the sense that we wonder sometimes whether we're ever going to recover from the downturn. This recession right here, this was 72 months in, that's six years, and the US labor market still had not recovered all of the jobs that were lost during the Great Recession. It took us seven years to claw back from the, the losses of the Great Recession. So it was a very deep and protracted and bad recession, and part of the reason is that the policy response was too weak. And part of the reason the policy response was too weak was fear of running bigger budget deficits to offset this, okay? So as consumers pulled back, because consumers had leveraged up, they had borrowed, they had taken on debt, they turned their homes into ATM machines, they started extracting the equity in the home to finance other things, and this drove a tremendous boom in the US economy until it didn't, until things crashed. And when the housing market collapsed, consumption fell. And so the boxes on the conveyor belt started to build up. And so firms started to lay off workers. And that's what happened. We were losing 800,000 jo jobs a month in the US. I can hardly say it. 800,000 jobs a month, right? So this is the problem. We, we lost control completely. Now, some people would have said, and some economists actually did say, even during the Great Recession, well, the way out of this is to get the rest of the world to buy this stuff. So if, if households in the US won't buy stuff, we just have to, you know, we need a weaker dollar. We started to blame China. You heard things like that. The value of the dollar is too high. If we could just get the dollar down, the rest of the world would buy our stuff, and that would help the US economy recover. So let's de you know, depend on the rest of the world. That's the kind of stuff you're hearing from Donald Trump now. Right, where he says, look, we have trade deficits. This is a problem. We have to reverse this. We don't want the rest of the world taking advantage of us. Right? We've become their piggy bank. This is the kind of language that he's using. The problem is, if you want demand to recover and you want the rest of the world to engineer that recovery, what they're doing is not just helping create the jobs, but they're also taking the stuff. Yes? So when you're producing for export, the other countries get to enjoy the benefits of consuming the stuff that your people produced. So it's your labor time, it's your raw materials, it's your resources that you're using here at home, but then you're sending to the rest of the world to enjoy. So one of the things I think that's being missed in this debate about trade, especially with Donald Trump, is that exports in real terms are a cost to the country that's exporting, okay? In other words, think about it this way. You could have used your workers, their time, your resources, your raw materials to produce things and keep them domestically and raise the domestic standard of living. Instead, you sent them abroad to raise someone else's standard of living. It's not something you hear people talk about, but I think it's important to keep in mind as we have discussions about trade. So, is there another way? If households, uh, who's that? Okay, so if households aren't taking the boxes off the conveyor belt and you don't want the rest of the world to take all the boxes away because then your people don't have boxes to consume and raise standard of living, is there another way to backfill the lost demand? Where else could it come from? And the only other answer here is from the government because that's the only other place it can come from. So I'm asking this question. What if the government commits to maintaining a full employment economy? What would that look like? How would it work? If it commits to balancing conditions in the economy rather than committing to balancing the budget. So what austerity does is austerity says, all right, we're going to force the economy to balance the budget. Yeah? Instead, allow the budget to balance the economy. Yeah? What would that look like? What does a balanced economy look like? Now, we can have political debates about that. For me, I would say, an imbalanced economy is one that looks like this, where the concentration of wealth and income is going increasingly into the hands of a smaller and smaller number of people. That's an imbalance. It's an imbalance that's not just um, you know, morally upsetting, it's an imbalance that causes the economy to malfunction. You don't, uh, the economy doesn't function as well if you're shoveling most of the income into the hands of the people who are least likely to turn around and spend it into the economy. That robs you of, of sales and customers and demand. So it would be far better to rebalance the distribution of wealth and income. 
A balanced economy doesn't have millions of children living in poverty. A balanced economy doesn't have infrastructure that's crumbling around you. A balanced economy doesn't have seniors who are you know, on fixed income living in poverty. So imagine, and we can all come up with our own definition of what a balanced economy would look like, but at least if you set the goals as objective, I want to cut the child poverty rate to zero in 10 years' time. I want to repair every structurally deficient bridge um, so that it's you know, not structurally deficient in two years' time. I want to, right, mission-oriented. Set the goals and allow the budget to help you achieve those objectives. So the budget becomes the tool to carrying out mission-oriented budgeting. No particular budget outcome is more desirable than any other. If it takes a deficit that's equal to 3% of your GDP to balance your economy, okay. So I have a good economy. The kids are healthy, the seniors are well cared for, the infrastructure is fixed, I don't have inflation problem, I've got good conditions. The number that appears on the ledger that gets written down, scrolled down, you know, Downing Street or whatever, who, who cares? I don't care if it's 3% or 4.5%, maybe it's a surplus of 1%. That number isn't what's important. The goals are what's important, and the budget is just the tool to get you to achieve those goals. So, you say, well, wait a minute, Kelton, that sounds nice, right? Pie in the sky and all. But we, we know that we're broke here, so this is not an option. We can't use the budget to balance the economy because the, we've already broken the budget, right? So here's the letter uh, from Liam, how, how do I say the last name? Sorry, Brian Byrne. Byrne. He leaves the letter, right, to the incoming chief secretary. Dear chief secretary, I'm afraid there is no money. <laughs> Kind regards and good luck, <laughs> right? Ha ha, okay, so this is, this is a joke, right? And it is a joke, I mean, it, it is a joke. But it isn't a one-off joke. It's a redundant, recurring theme, and it becomes not a joke, but it becomes something that we, the population begins to believe, right? And then we all subscribe to it, and then we don't wanna believe that we've got a government that's broke. I mean, that's not good, and as good, patriotic citizens, we want to make sure that we fix that, and so we'll make the sacrifices. So in the US, the language during the 2000s was about shared sacrifice, right? It was about all of us together cutting back and tightening our belts. We're in this together for the good of the country, right? To save our national solvency. And so, you know, that, that goes way, way back in time. There is no public money, she told us. There is only taxpayer money. This is a really important line. There is no public money. Right away, that says you have to find the money, but you're not going to find it from the public, right? You're not going to find it from the public sector. You're not going to find it in government. You have to find it outside of government. So who has the money? Where is the money? Ha, ah, it's taxpayer money. The taxpayer must pay for whatever it is, okay? What, what is behind this thinking? Behind this thinking is the idea that the government is constrained like a household or a private business. It has to arrange financing. If I want to go buy a new automobile, I show up at the dealer's car lot and I say, I like that one. Now, he doesn't let me drive away in the car until I do what? Pay for it. I have to show that I've got the financing. So I have to arrange the financing. I have to borrow the money. I have to show that, okay, here's where the money's coming from. Okay, so we think that the government is like a household or a business, that it prearranges its financing, and then it goes out and it does some spending, all right? We think the government, just like a household, can spend more than it collects, but only for a period of time, and only if it can find money from someone who got it, and they can borrow it, okay? You've gotta borrow the money from someone who has it. You gotta go out and get it. You need other people's money in order to be able to spend. The problem is, Money is an object, it's finite. There's only so much of it. There's a pile of pounds in the world, somewhere in a corner, and it's massive, but there's only so much of it. And everybody who wants a piece of it, private industry, the government, household, everyone who wants to borrow money has to go to that finite pile of pounds and compete for it. The more intense the competition, what? The higher the price goes, so the interest rate. So if government wants to borrow more money, they're competing with private industry. Ah, that drives up the price of money. So interest rates go up. Now what happens? 
higher interest rates crowd out the far more efficient private sector spending. And so investment goes down. So now we're scolded for government trying to do anything because it comes at the expense of private industry, which as we all know, is far more efficient than government at doing everything, right? So this is the story. You gotta find the money, there's only so much of it. The more you try to borrow, the less it leaves for someone else. Next thing you know, you've borrowed too much, right? There's a fine line between being solvent and insolvent. We've all seen people probably who go broke. A household takes on too much debt, has bills they can't pay. Right? They start missing payments, the bill collector comes. All of a sudden their credit gets downgraded. We've seen businesses go under, too much debt, right? Businesses fail. So we see the debt grow, we see creditors begin to worry. All of a sudden your credit score goes down. We think, well that same thing would happen to a government. Just like when my credit score goes down, your credit rating goes down. If you get downgraded by Moody's or Fitch or Standard & Poor's, then it's gonna cost you more to borrow next time. So now you're becoming even more insolvent, right? It's harder and harder to pay your bills. And we all know what happens, you end up like Greece. And I'm here to tell you that during the debt crisis, in the depths, I shouldn't say during, uh, sort, of an on, sort of a rolling debt crisis in the Eurozone, but during the depths of the crisis, 2010-ish, I would turn on the television in my kitchen at night and uh, Tom Brokaw, one of our leading right, um, commentators, news people would come on and the, the music in the background would go like this. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> and then he would say, the debt crisis in America and the program would begin. And I'm like, wait, what debt crisis in America did we just have? How did we get a debt crisis in America? But he started off telling viewers the debt crisis in America. And then in the backdrop was Greece. So the lesson to the American people was, this is you if you don't get your fiscal house in order, right? We were running big budget deficits because the economy had collapsed and we were told every day, day in and day out, that we had a debt problem, that we were gonna end up like the Greeks, okay? So behind it, in the backdrop, all of us are bombarded with these memes, household, government like a household, government, right? So tighten your belts, everybody, please. We're approaching Great Britain. So <laughs> these are the household memes. When you read or when you hear your politicians say, we must live within our means, right? We have to watch our budget. We must tighten our belts. We are running up the credit card. Going into debt is not the answer, right? We're going broke. Those are all that's language that applies to a household or to a private business, but not one that is applicable to a government like the United States or like Britain. Okay, so why? I love Twain, so I, I quote Twain uh, pretty often. So here's Mark Twain, right? It ain't what you know that gets you into trouble, it's what you know for sure that just ain't so. <laughs> okay, so what is it that we know for sure that just ain't so? I'm gonna, I have lots of things that I normally use to get the audience warmed up to this idea, but because I have a time constraint, I'm only gonna present one, um, and it didn't require audio, so I went with this one. Look, this is the St. Louis Federal Reserve Bank, so I think we can trust the St. Louis Fed. Can we agree that the Fed is not a partisan, liberal, hack organization? This is the St. Louis Federal Reserve, and what they're telling us here in research published by the St. Louis Fed is that as the sole manufacturer of dollars, whose debt is denominated in dollars, the U.S. government can never become insolvent. So let's pause, we won't even read the rest. As the sole manufacturer, what is the word that we use in everyday language when there's one maker, one manufacturer of something? What do we call it? A monopolist. <gasps> A monopolist. So who's played this game? Everybody's played this game, right? Or seen this game played or knows what this game is. So when you play the game of Monopoly, and you open up the instructions. I hate this game, it never ends, right? But when you play this game, you open up the instructions and what is the first thing you do? Very good, you choose someone who you trust, whom you trust, to control the currency, to issue the money. Okay, most of the time the audience says you, you fight over the dog and the shoe and whatever. <laughs> I say, okay, fair enough. But the second thing you do is you pick someone to be the banker. So you figure out who's going to issue the money in this game, okay? 
So imagine that you take the board out and you set up all the pieces and somebody says, okay, before we get the game going, I'm gonna need all the players to pay their taxes. So you have to fund me, right? Would the game ever begin? No, it's silly. You can't even start the game. The first thing that has to happen is that somebody has to spend the currency into the game or the game can't begin. So somebody provides an allocation. You get two five hundreds, you get this many one hundreds, and, da, da, da. and now the players are ready to play. Okay, now there's money. What happens? You roll the dice, you go around. If you get lucky, you land on the chance and you draw the card and it says, uh, you got lucky, pay, uh, you got paid $50. Ooh, okay, so I get a payment, right? Maybe it's my social security, maybe it's some other form of government payment, but here comes money. Then I keep going, and all of a sudden I draw a card and it says, IRS, pay your taxes. Yeah. So 100 leaves the game, okay? So 100 is paid in taxes, that goes out of the game. Now I'm trying to get by, I'm trying to buy things as I go around the board. If I make it all the way around, they top me up. I get 200 for pass and go, right? When does the game end? The game ends when more has been collected out than has been paid back in, yeah? As long as the person who's in charge of the money is putting more into the game than they're taking out, the game proceeds. Problems arise as soon as someone starts taxing out of the game too much and not replacing it with enough. Now the balances of all the players goes down and pretty soon you have nobody left to play the game. Okay, so this game, illustrates something important about being the monopolist, being the issuer. In fact, the rules of the game say that in the event that the game goes on so long that you run out of money to pay in, that you write an IOU. And this is in the instructions of the game, okay? And you keep the game going. Why? Because money is no object, right? It's just a ledger. It's a spreadsheet entry. It's a ledger entry. So you continue the game. All right, so this is a pretty good illustration, I think, of how public money works in a country like the US, in a country like the UK. Sadly, the rest of us, we don't have this capacity. We aren't issuers of currency. We're merely the users of the currency. So everybody here is a user of pounds, I assume, unless you've traveled from elsewhere. I'm a user of the US dollar, but I don't issue it, unfortunately. I do not have the power of the public purse. It puts me in a different relationship, it means that Language that makes perfectly good sense to apply to me, going broke, running out of money, needing to tighten my belt, right, all that kind of stuff, perfectly sensible when applied to me, but nonsensical when applied to the issuer of the currency. Okay, so money is no object for certain governments. I'm gonna tell you what I mean by that. Most governments <laughs> tell you what the unit of account is, how they're going to spend, in what currency they're going to spend, in what currency they're going to collect taxes, and in what currency they're going to borrow. The government decides this. In the US, the government has decided the unit of account is called the dollar, right? The government spends taxes and borrows in US dollars. In Britain, the unit of account is the pound. The British pound comes from where? The British government, and it can't come from anywhere else. In the US, the dollar comes from the US government and it can't legally come from anywhere else. If I get caught trying to manufacture dollars in my garage, it's called counterfeiting and I go to jail, right? I can't do it. I don't, they, the government has given unto itself the exclusive right to issue the currency. No one else, not China, not anybody else can issue the US dollar. Only the US government can issue the currency. In Britain, only the British government can issue the pound. In Japan, only the Japanese government can issue the yen. One nation, one money. That's how it works in most of the world, okay? Most nations require that taxes be paid in a currency that the state has the exclusive power to issue. So my taxes in the US are due in US dollars. I can't pay my taxes in any other currency and I can't get the currency from anywhere other than the US government. We call this sovereign money. So the US, Japan, the UK, they have sovereign money, okay? <coughs> Governments spend in these countries by instructing their banks, their central banks, to change the numbers in someone's account upward. So you sell goods to the government, your account gets credited with US dollars. Where did the money come from? 
It didn't come from anywhere. It came from the keyboard at the New York Federal Reserve Bank, which is putting the entries into your account because the government said, I bought from him, go credit his account. So Boeing or Lockheed or whomever gets a credit to their account. They're not literally printing money and taking it over to your bank. They're not literally taking money from the pile that exists in the world or from someone else's account and transferring. They're creating it. They're spending it into existence. We say taxes drive money. As long as the state retains the power to both make and enforce its tax laws, the people need the government's money. See, we've thought of this the wrong way around. When Margaret Thatcher said there is no public money, there is only taxpayer money, she's wrong, okay? It's not they who need our money, it's we who need their money. Okay? We need their money in order to settle our obligations to the state. They are taxing us in pounds. You have to get the pound. Where do you get the pound? Uh -huh, from the British government, right? So we've just flipped this thing around and convinced ourselves that they need our money instead of the other way around. The currency itself gets its value from by virtue of the fact that the government demands that we all make payments to government in a currency that they and only they can create. That gives the currency value. It allows the government to move resources from the private sector into the public domain. And here I'll tell a quick story. How's my time, by the way? Oh, you're so interested you forgot to watch the clock. Good for you. Good for you. How many? 50 more minutes. Oh, for the whole session. Oh, well, I should speed up a bit, um, but I'm not going to. So, so Britain used to understand this. In fact, we learned from you. Okay, I'm, not my, I'm married to a historian, so if the history is not perfect, um, I don't even have an excuse. I should, I should get it really right, but I'm gonna give you the, the thumbnail version of the history here. Okay, when Britain colonized Africa, what happened? They sail over, hop off the boat, I'm taking some liberties, have a look around and say, gee, there are some really interesting things here that we don't have back home. We sure would like to have some of them. How's about we buy them from you, right? Offering up British pounds in payment. And the Africans said what? <laughs> Cheerio, safe trip home. <laughs> no, thank you. Right? Why would we want to give up our resources? Why would we hand our stuff over to you in exchange for this paper? Well, lovely. I mean, the, the, the queen looks lovely and all, but we're really not interested in this swap. So what did Britain do? I don't think you understand. See, <laughs> what we're setting up here is a colony and you're going to need to make payment to the crown, okay? And the payments will be due in British pounds. Oh dear, we don't have any British pounds. How, how, can, we pay, how can we pay the tax to the crown? We can help you with that. <laughs> we can help you with that. All you have to do is sell us some of this cool stuff we were admiring, we'll pay you, and now you'll have the currency to settle your obligation to the crown. See how easy it is to monetize an economy that wasn't previously using money? The tax gets value, didn't have any value at first, gets its value by virtue of the fact that you now need it to keep your head, <laughs> right? So these are the benefits of retaining your sovereign money. The government can never go broke. It doesn't make sense to use that language. It can afford to buy whatever is for sale in the domestic unit of account. So whatever people are trying to sell in order to get pounds is theoretically the limit to what the British government can afford. What is for sale in pounds, okay? It doesn't need to borrow its own currency and it can always set the interest rate that it chooses to pay on any money that it does borrow because borrowing is an option, okay? If I almost brought my props but I knew I wouldn't have time. Um, this gives a country additional policy space. It allows you to run better fiscal policy to manage your economy. Okay, what happened in the Eurozone? complete and utter mess in terms of what they did to their monetary system. These countries abandoned their sovereign currencies. Okay, they said, I'm giving up the drachma, I'm giving up the lira, I'm giving up the franc, and I'm gonna start using this foreign currency called the euro. Notice, British pound, US dollar, Japanese yen, something euro. You don't even know what to put in front of that because it's not one nation, one money anymore. 
it's one market, one money. And the euro was created around a completely different philosophy, that one market needs one money rather than one nation needs one money. Okay, so the currency is divorced from the nation state, making the euro itself basically like a foreign currency. These countries have to actually go out and find the money in order to spend. They really are revenue constrained. They really are subject to the whims of the bond market and they have to pay market interest rates. Completely different animal here. Okay, they lack the kind of power that a sovereign currency issuer like the UK or the US has. This is a quote from an economist who was a contemporary of John Maynard Keynes. Um, his name was Abba Lerner. Uh, I'm a big fan of much of his work. He says here, by virtue of the power, because a country has the power to create and destroy money by fiat and take money away from people by taxation, it puts the government in a position to keep the spending in the economy at a level necessary to maintain full employment. In other words, if you have your own currency, you can have a good economy. This is what Lerner is, is saying here. Now suppose you want to build a good society. John Kenneth Galbraith wrote a book and called it The Good Society. Okay, what would that look like? What would a good society look like? And the first question everyone will want to know is, but how will you pay for your good society? Okay, so now, with apologies to his brother, who is with us, I won't point him out uh, in case he doesn't want it known, um, they did ask me to draw on some experience. So I'm gonna do a little bit of this. And I, I think you're with me. I don't think I'm losing my audience, so if it's okay, I'm gonna keep going until I'm finished and we'll use whatever Q&A time is left. So I uh, worked for Senator Sanders on the budget committee and then I advised the campaign. And so I got a, a little bit of a flavor of what it was like to be in his situation and responding always to press questions and to his political uh, opponents and so forth with these kinds of questions. So here's a guy who had an ambitious agenda Right, wanted to do lots of big things. Hillary Clinton, uh, the main uh, uh, contender in the race, um, you know, challenged him on education, on infrastructure. Wherever she came in, he came in bigger, right? And so she writes about this in her book where you know, it comes out after the race is all over. And she says, oh, it was so frustrating because every time we tried to do something bold, he went bigger. <laughs> and she said, so, and, and she's having an email exchange with someone and that part becomes part of the book. And this someone emails back to her and he says, I assume it's a he, he says, um, it's like Bernie says, I think America should get a pony. And Hillary, the sensible, rational, right, fiscally responsible candidate says, how will you pay for the pony? So he's depicted as this pie in the sky agenda, completely unaffordable, not, right? Right, that's the depiction. Puppies and rainbows and unicorns. My position is this is a trap. So this is the way that Hillary Clinton approached policymaking. She said you cannot cut taxes or increase spending unless you can pay for it. Okay, unless you can pay for it. What she's saying here is one must not add to the deficit. Everything must be deficit neutral, fully offset. If you're gonna put 100 in, you either need to take 100 out in taxes or cut 100 out of some other part of the budget. You must not disturb the deficit, right? This is her position. I'm arguing that is a trap. It traps us, it limits our policy choices, and it leaves us with an economy that is operating far below its means. We're not living anywhere near our means. Okay, so if you get trapped in this though, where everybody is demanding that you show your work, and that's what they did, in the race, show your work. How are you gonna pay for everything? So he says, I want a trillion dollars of infrastructure. How will you pay for it? He says, I wanna make public colleges and universities tuition free. How will you pay for it? He says, I want Medicare for all. How will you pay for it? And so if you're bound by those rules, then you have to show where the money will come from. And so he did. And what he did was say, look, if I have to find the money, then I have to go where the money is. And where is the money? The rich people have all the money, <laughs> right? The rich people have all the money. So we end up going after Amazon, Bezos, and, and Walmart, and the Koch brothers. And don't get me wrong, we should go after them, okay? 
but the, the, it, it becomes a magnet because that's where the money is. So it's the lure. We go there because that's where the money is. I want to make public colleges and universities tuition free. How will you pay for it? Wall Street will pay for it. Okay, we'll put a tax on, he said, Wall Street speculation or financial transactions tax. We'll raise the money, we'll pay for everything, right? So it becomes this sort of a thing. So now the question is, okay, so if you want a really bold agenda, then these are the rules that we currently play by. You have to find the money. Who's got the money? Rich people have the money. So you go get the money from the rich people, from wealthy, from Wall Street, and you tax the money, and that gives you the revenue that you need in order to redistribute, fund programs, help the poor, right, the elderly, whatever the case may be. So what it does is it forces you to have two policy fights. You don't just have to fight to make public colleges and universities tuition free and fight for that agenda on its merits. You also have to fight to raise taxes on Wall Street or also have to fight, you see what I'm saying? It sets up simultaneously two battles. Right? Because you haven't decoupled the spending from the revenue. So you have to both win on the revenue side in order to win on the spending side. So if you say, we're going to fix crumbling infrastructure and feed hungry kids, the answer is, yeah, if you can find the money. But unless and until you can, you're not fixing anything and you're not feeding nobody. Right? Because you haven't found the money. So in a sense, it's cruel. Right? Because it holds hostage. Hungry people, sick people, suffering people, poor people are held hostage while you try to pick some money off of the wealthy. And unless and until you win on that, you can't take care of business building a good society. Okay, so it's, I find it frustrating. Okay, here's what is the purpose of a tax. I'm going to move as quickly as I can through the rest of this. This is from a paper that was published in 1946. And it was published by a guy named Beardsley Rummel, who was the head of the New York Federal Reserve Bank. Head of the New York Fed. So no slouch. Okay? And what he does is he writes an article and he titles it, Taxes for Revenue Are Obsolete. Taxes for revenue? What the hell else are taxes for if they're not for revenue? Right? And he says, no, nope, obsolete. Why did he say that? He tells you right here in this passage, the necessity for government to tax in order to maintain its independence and solvency is true for state and local governments, but it is not true for the national government. Two things have happened which have changed the rules of the game. One, we got a central bank and we know how to use it. Two, we went off the gold standard. There it is right there. You're no longer on a gold standard. If you're on a gold standard, finding the money is a real thing. You literally had to dig in the ground, in the mines to find the money, right? And he's saying, we suspended the gold standard to go to war so that we would have the fiscal capacity to spend whatever is necessary to win the war. And that's exactly what happened. The financing was not constrained by revenue. Government ramped up deficit spending, held interest rates down by telling the central bank exactly where it wanted interest rates pegged, and the deficits were run. Nothing bad happened. We won the war, and the American economy prospered for decades after that. Okay? So he says, look, we don't collect taxes because we need the money. Obviously, we're the sole manufacturer of the currency. Why would we tax to get it? We create it. We issue it. Okay, so taxes do other stuff. They allow the government to spend money into the economy without inflating the economy, without causing inflation. If I want to spend a trillion into the economy on infrastructure, and I say, eh, I don't need the revenue, so I'm not going to tax anything out, holy moly, you might get an inflation problem just spending a trillion in. So the question becomes, how much can you safely spend to mobilize resources that are currently unused, right, unemployment? You have construction workers, architects, engineers, you have steel, you have concrete, you have machinery that's not being used by anyone in the economy. So you're not going to crowd it out. You say, aha, I'm going to spend hiring these construction workers, that engineer, that architect. I'm going to take these machines that move heavy stuff and make concrete. I'm going to hire all these things, and I'm going to spend on that. And if I try to do too much, I'm going to get an inflation problem. So I'm going to have to pull some income out of the economy, tax some money out in order to guard against the risk of inflation. So taxes do that. 
Taxes are important because they help redistribute income. They take income away from people if you think they have too much. So taxes play an important role there. They incentivize or disincentivize behaviors. You might provide tax incentives to encourage people to drive electric cars or to discourage people from smoking or eating too much sugar or whatever. So taxes do important things, but Rummel's point was they, you don't need them in order to raise revenue. That's not what they do. Okay, so go back to this picture. And now, look at it from this vantage point. We're gonna take from the Waltons, from Jeff Bezos and from the Koch brothers, not because we're desperate for their cash in order to care for our people, but because they have too damn much cash. You do it because it's that degree of inequality is bad for democracy, it's bad for the functioning of the economy, not because you're, you're helpless at caring for the people in your, in your um, nation without their help, you don't need them, you can go around them, you don't have to go through them, but you do it because you wanna rebalance the distribution of income, you want a balanced economy. Go here, I want to make public colleges and universities tuition free. I'm not gonna tax Wall Street because I need their money to pay the tuition. I'm gonna tax Wall Street because I want to disincentivize Wall Street speculation. And if I'm successful, what happens to Wall Street speculation? If my tax is successful, it goes down. People do less of it, right? People say, oh, they put a sin tax on speculation. So I'm gonna do less of it. Now you don't wanna say that my revenue to pay for free college is dependent upon something that I abhor, which is Wall Street speculation. So you could say we're gonna do a financial transactions tax because we think there's too much speculative behavior and it creates bubbling economies and it creates financial instability and so forth, right? So you could rethink the way that you talk about taxes. So my position is, when we think of government budgeting, we have it completely backwards. I'm gonna do this quickly because I've already said it many times. We think taxing and borrowing come first. That's first order. The government says, okay, I'm gonna put together a budget, but before I do, I'm going to see how much revenue I can raise. So I'm gonna raise taxes, I'm gonna collect, now I'm gonna borrow, so I'm gonna get some more pounds. Now I have money and now I can spend. So who's going to pay the tab? becomes the question. Who's gonna pick up the tab? How will you pay for it? You need taxes and, and you gotta borrow before you can do anything. Nope, it's the other way around. Government, think of monopoly game. Government has to spend the currency into the economy before anyone can have it. And once it's spent into the economy, people now have some to return in payment of taxes and they have some to swap out to get bonds, which are interest bearing and kind of cool because they're super safe investment vehicle that you can own if you wanna give up some of your currency in exchange for a bond. But the spending has to come first, just like when Britain colonized Africa. You couldn't collect the tax until the government first spent the pounds into, into the economy, okay? So it muddles the debate. What we do muddles the debate. This thinking right here from a newspaper just two days ago, I think. Um, she says, oh, we face a dilemma because you know we have this crisis, we wanna take care of healthcare, and we have three choices. We can either raise taxes, raise the revenue, slash spending, okay, austerity, cuts to other programs to free up some money, or break our spending rules. Guess which one I'm in favor of, right? <laughs> There's one here that makes a lot more sense than the other two from my perspective. So you just put the handcuffs on. You tie your shoes together and complain you can't run. So bend over, untie your shoes, and go run around. And that's basically what has to happen here. You've committed to austerity, you've committed to budget rules, you've committed to trying to force the economy to balance the budget instead of allowing the budget to balance the economy. And so if you don't wanna disregard your rules, then these are your only two choices, right? You're gonna increase taxes or you're gonna slash government programs in order to try to sustain something instead of keeping your eye on what really matters. And here is the last, I think, slide. And what I'm gonna try to do is you know, bring it all together and say we're too stuck on the money question, we're too stuck on the financing, we're too stuck on the how will you pay for it in money terms. What matters is the real stuff in our economy. What matters are the resources, the real resources that are at our disposal. 
So if you have millions of people who are unemployed, factories operating far below their capacity, resources available to be mobilized, then the government can do what Mariana said. Can say, what should the mission be? We have all of these things lying around. There's, the market is not bidding for them. There is a zero bid for unemployed labor. Yeah? The price of unemployed labor is zero. There's no bid. So if I'm looking out at the vast resources that are available to me, and I say, what could we be doing with the riches that we have? Then you focus on the real things. And now you have a tough choice to make, because you have to prioritize. Should we do infrastructure? Should we do child care? Should we do health care? Should we have competing alternative uses for all of the available resources that you have, but the money pushes those resources into their productive uses, right? But remember, the government can afford to buy whatever is for sale in British pounds. So if you have people unemployed, unemployment is evidence of people looking for what? Paid work. Okay? So you can put those people to work. So in the US right now, Senator Sanders and others, including I think most of the uh, people that um, we think would probably be running for president in 2020, including Senator uh, Cory Booker and Kirsten Gillibrand, they're House members, and they're all putting forward legislation around trying to create good jobs. Good, good jobs, meaning high paying jobs. So in the case of Senator Sanders, as, you, as, is, um, as is his norm, he's going bigger than everybody else. And so he's uh, announced that he's gonna be um, putting forward legislation to introduce a federal job guarantee program, which is basically a public option in the labor market, which says if you're unemployed and you would like to be working, we will find a job for you. Okay, it will be a federally funded program, but it will be locally administered. So the idea is that local communities will have a say in the type of work that gets done. So, you know, imagine Britain and think of all of the communities where there are pockets of high unemployment. And you were to go into those communities and say, what would you have people do if somebody provided you with workers to do things? Would you want community gardens? Would you want to deal with climate issues or soil erosions? Would you, does your library need new bookshelves? How about your elder care facilities? Are there enough staff there to hold hands, talk to, um, read to, play checkers with? What, what does a good society look like to you in the community? You propose projects, and the projects go up through the chain of approval, and if they're approved, they get federally funded. Right? And so you can imagine what kinds of opportunities would be available if we let go of the how will you pay for it, where will the money come from question, and focused on what really matters, right? the resources that we have at our disposal, and how best to put them to use to serve the public good. Yeah? Does it, is that OK? Do you want me to just, yeah, sure. Uh, my name's Deborah. Um, I was, the two things, um, I'm an NHS campaigner, so I'm campaigning for the National Health Service, mm -hmm. uh, which you referred to there uh, in one of your slides. Um, and I was looking at your last, the last slide about have we lost sight of things and looking at the title, rethinking how public value is created. And I was wondering whether in here, in the UK, whether it shouldn't be more rediscovering how public value mm. was created, because we created a welfare state and national health service after the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, which was at a time of absolute devastation and, poverty, uh, and you know, absolute need in the country. And the government did precisely what you're talking about now. It spent. Um, and Bevan, who actually was the, and Aaron Bevan, who was the creator of the, of the NHS, um, he said something when he resigned that I think will really resonate with you about what you're talking about because um, he resigned because they were bringing charges into the NHS and he wanted it to be entirely free. He said the country could afford for it to be entirely free. And the, um, the, the, the argument that took place in the cabinet office was about spending on defence. And he said there was nothing to buy, <laughs> that the, everything had gone, the, 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 the precious metals, um, everything that they needed, all the, all the special chemicals they needed to make the, 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 the arms, they'd been used up in the war. And that the America, which was very powerful because it had 
send a lot of its real resources to the rest of the world during the war, and the rest of the world were now having to send it back again to America. He said, there isn't anything to buy there. He said, why would you give them the defence budget money when there's nothing for them to buy, when we've got people who are sick all over the place who really do need the money? And when, when Theresa May makes those three choices mm, and she yeah. says we can... Uh, we have to either increase the taxes, which impoverishes people, yep. actually literally takes money out of their pocket, or we can cut the other services, which have already been cut to the core, yep. or we can, we can deficit spend. Deficit spend is the only one yeah. that doesn't harm or exactly. kill people. Not only that, it improves things. So let me do this. I, I was going to mention I was going to bring my props, and I ended up not doing it because we would have gone an extra 15 minutes, but very quickly. Most of the audiences that I talk to are in the financial community. I, for whatever reason, I end up talking to lots and lots of people who are financial advisors, financial planners, and there will be rooms with four or 800 or 1,400 people. And these are people who work in finance. So you would expect that they would you know, know something about money and finance. And yet I go in and you talk to them about the government's, but now remind, let me remind you, they tell all their clients, spend less than you earn, save and pay down your debt. That's the advice to every one of their clients. And it's perfectly rational advice. So they come into that with that mindset. And they believe the federal government, like everybody else, should play by that set of rules. Then I do a little exercise with them. And I say, OK, let's find out whether you understand the deficit and the national debt. So you would think that they would, because again, they work with money and finance. They don't have a clue. They hate it, and they're mad at the deficit until I get done with them. And so here's what I do. I go in and I say, okay, I'll, be the, I'll play the role of the government. And so I have my basically monopoly money, but it has my picture on it. And so they're, Kel they're, they're Kelton bucks, right? So I'm the government, so I'm going to spend some money into the economy. You're all in the private sector of my economy, businesses, households. And so I'm going to spend 10 into the economy. So I hand someone 10. Now they have 10, right? And I say, but I'm going to collect taxes now. So I'm going to tax back seven. So they hand me back seven. And I say, what did I do? I ran a deficit. So I go and I scroll it down, minus three, Kel you know, government of Kelton. So now you're supposed to be very angry at me because I did this irresponsible thing called running a budget deficit. My minus three, how mad are you? You're sitting there holding three. Where'd you get it? You got it from me. And you wouldn't have that three if I hadn't put in more than I took out. So now they're thinking, huh. And I say, but wait, let's do it, let's do it the proper way. Let's balance the budget. So give me the money back. We'll do it again. So I spend 10 in. I tax 10 out. Now I've balanced my budget. I go right down. Balanced budget, smiley face. Everybody is supposed to be happy. Are you happy? No, I miss my three, right? <laughs> I miss my three. So I say, well, OK, hang on. Let's go do it the Clinton way, because this is what really excites the Democrats, right? Those Clinton surpluses. So <laughs> I'll. I, but now, you know, you have a problem because in order for me to run a surplus, I have to collect more from you than I put back into the economy. So taxes have to be higher than government spending. So now you see yourself going into the red so that I can go into the black. So you're, you have the deficit, I have the surplus. How do you feel? And they go, miserable, <laughs> right? <laughs> Give me back my deficit. So the point is, people don't have the foggiest idea. And then you do the national debt. What is the national debt? I spend 10 into the economy. I tax seven out. You're holding three Kelton dollars. I hold up three treasuries. I also have them laminated with my picture. <laughs> and these are treasuries, right? And I say, who would like to buy these three Kelton treasury bonds? And sure enough, the person in the audience who's got the three Kelton dollars that don't pay any interest would like to swap them for the treasuries, which pay interest. Now you feel even happier, because not only did I give you money, I'm subsidizing your savings with free interest money, right? Which is what's happening when the government borrows. The money to buy the bonds comes from the deficit spending itself. So you're not even out anything. You're up, your wealth is up, your income is up. The problem is with the distribution because who holds those treasuries? They're not equitably distributed across the economy. They're mostly concentrated in the hands of the wealthy who can afford to save and put money into investment vehicles like treasuries and so forth. So, it, it isn't that the national debt is a bad thing. It's your asset. My liability, it's your asset, right? And you're getting a risk-free asset, and I'm paying you to have it. And you, we could talk about why I do that. <laughs> um, oh, I don't like to be the one to take the questions. 
No, no, you can, you, do you wanna uh, see the microphone and just yeah. pass it on to you? I'll give shorter answers so everybody can. <laughs> Uh, hi, Stephanie. My name is Tomas. I'm second year PhD student at the IIPP at UCL. Great. Um, and one of the main interests, I mean, especially for when it comes to my research, is about monitoring the financial system. So I know a bit about the MMT, which is the main school of thought that comes from the US. And, um, and I was wondering whether you, can, you could comment on the outcome of uh, of a referendum that was held in Switzerland a couple of days ago in which the citizens were asked to outstrip the private banking sector uh, from the power of creating money, well, a special kind of money, which is not government money, um, because especially this uh, somehow shows that uh, in the current uh, um, financial system, there's not just government money or public money, but there's uh, different sorts of money or cash or uh, financial liabilities, if you want. So, uh, and I would say there's a hierarchy of money, which is both at the national and the international level, because if, if we look at money across nations, we can see the US dollar having a different role from, I don't know, Japanese yen or yep. the, the euro. And so how would you imagine a financial system different from the current one? Maybe a sort of financial system that actually uh, is aligned with the uh, public interest in a democratic society. Okay, let me, because you are uh, a PhD student, I will give you assignments. Uh, <laughs> rather than, it's a big question, and we could have a long uh, conversation over a drink about it, but instead I'll say two things. I don't know the outcome of the referendum. Good. That would have been, uh, I was tweeting about it. I'm sure that uh, had something to do with its failure. Um, no, people here in the UK, uh, like Anne Pettifor and Francis Coppola, were also weighing in, also taking the position that I took uh, as well. People are um, doing crazy things, I think, uh, because they see, they try to diagnose the problem, and they see that private banks were somehow involved in creating credit that somehow drove the um, housing bubble that ended up collapsing the economy and therefore, working backwards, the way to stop something like this from happening again is to strip private banks of the ability to make loans that create deposits. Okay, this is not my position. So you asked how I would go about restructuring the financial system to make it safer and that sort of thing. There is a, a very good, um, outline, and it's quite detailed, and it was written by Warren Mosler, it's published at Huffington Post. It's a proposal to reform the banking system, is I think what it's called. And I, we worked on it together as a group, uh, so you, you should look at that. Because <laughs> it's not a short answer. Lots needs to be done. Uh, thank you very much, uh -huh. I really enjoyed your presentation. Uh, my question is, do you have to be a globally powerful sovereign currency for uh, your argument to hold the examples that you used with the US and the UK. Obviously, a lot of investment is needed in infrastructure mm -hmm. in developing countries in the global south. How much of what you presented would you have to change? Yeah, great question. Um, to, if you were to be talking about different kinds of countries. Great question. So keep in mind two key points. One is that the government is spending, borrowing, taxing only in its own currency. So if you've got countries like Ecuador or you know, Argentina with its you know, uh, messed up system where so much is US dollar denominated, those countries are not gonna be able to exercise the, the fiscal capacities. But what about, do, do you have to be a country like the US or the UK or Japan in order to do this? The answer is no. What you have to, and, and remember I said the limit, the upper limit is what is for sale in your currency? So, you know, India has an employer of last resort program, or I don't know a lot about it, but, um, and, and you could, I'm sure, uh, talk to me a lot about it, and I'd love to hear that. But look, if you are a country that has a sovereign currency, even if you're a small open economy, you can say, what are the resources that are available here domestically, 
And if they're for sale, I can mobilize them, I can buy them. If there's labor that's unemployed that wants to work for my currency, I can hire it, I can put it to work. That doesn't mean that I can have access to the rest of the world's resources that are, are not available domestically, raw materials and things like that. I'm gonna have to trade for those, I'm gonna have to get the other country's currency if they won't accept mine. Um, so there are some limits, but the, the limit is what's for sale in your own currency. You can do a lot with that. Mm. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed that, Stephanie. And, Thank you. And I just wanted to mention, though, you, you brought up the, the game of Monopoly. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you, you used it as the monopolization of the creation of uh, money, but I don't know if you're aware, it was actually intended to uh, demonstrate the monopoly of land. It was actually called the yeah, land of course. game. Yes. Um, but also, um, just to pick up, because we come from the land value taxation sort of movement, and um, we're very interested in the MMT uh -huh. sort of combination. But you did mention about taxation. I mean, the big thing, of course, you know, is that actually repricing. The, 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 the land market is totally dysfunctional. Yep. And so that is one of the important taxes that has to be. Do you know the work of Michael Hudson? Of course yes, you do, of course. of course. So I was just with Michael, we did a panel together last week in New York City. And so we've, we've done dog and pony shows in the past. So there's a nice compliment to the MMT and the Georgia School. And of course, um, you, you have a perfectly rational uh, justification for putting up taxes in order to address problems associated with land value, overvaluation. Yeah, perfectly. Compatible. Okay, I'm going to take three questions now. Do you want a pen and paper to write them down? Or will you remember? Oh, I won't remember even one. <laughs> that's, that's called the gin and tonic effect. That she's that's doing. water. <laughs> that's water. It's gin and tonic. Here you go. <laughs> Presentation. Thank, Thank you very you. much. My name is Peter. Um, I, I noticed there showing the slides uh, with Bernie Sanders. Now you would have voted Bernie Sanders, but the slides you showed showed him, in effect, as it were. The thought came to me, not following your advice. So I'm kind of quite interested in the arguments that are put by people who don't follow your theory, uh, not so much from within their own theory, as it were, but within your own theory, uh, because it seems to me that that's where we'd need to get to in terms of the political acceptability and viability of the theory sort of um, playing out in, in the US and, and in the UK. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is Patricia from the Gower Institute. Um, um, I want to, um, I'm originally from South America. A lot of countries over there have borrowed over the years from uh, the IMF mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. dollars. Uh, right now, Argentina is doing that. I believe this country also has some history with borrowing from the IMF. Is there ever uh, a good idea to do that? Is, is it all any, ever necessary to do that? Well, it's, it's not. Oh, right, 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 right. <laughs> Anthony Malloy from the Labour Land Campaign. Stephanie, at the beginning, you talked about demand and supply. And later on, you talked about socially beneficial government deficit spending. You know. like, how do you mix those two? Like, I mean, presumably you're, you're advocating a job guarantee rather than a universal basic income because the former stimulates supply as well as demand. You know. is, is that the right way of looking at it? Okay. Okay. Peter. Um, so... I think the tide is shifting. So his question to remind was, um, was my advice disregarded? Uh, because Senator Sanders attempt to pay for everything, right? To be fair, I started working for him in January and he announced that he was going to run in April or May. So it takes a while to warm up to me. Um, <laughs> he, 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 you know, and what I said is, is real. You are bound by the rules of Washington. And imagine how much less serious he would have appeared, I think, had he not attempted to dialogue the way that other candidates dialogue. Um, I will point out, however, that um, he likes to say this phrase, change doesn't come from the top down. Change comes from where? The bottom up. 
So what I do is I try very hard to go into communities, to give public talks, to get myself out there in social media and to communicate with regular people because I think that's the pressure point. I really do believe that our politicians will be more likely to let go of some of that rhetoric when we stop holding their feet to the fire every time they show up for a town hall meeting and we're asking them about the deficit, they think, well, I gotta pay attention to the deficit because all of my constituents are asking me about, so let's stop doing that. Let's make sure that we tell them that we want them to unleash the full force of the public purse to serve our interests because the Republicans just demonstrated that they have no qualms whatsoever adding to the deficit if it means achieving their goals. And their goals are cutting corporate taxes and giving big tax breaks to the donor class. Though that's their agenda. They're laser focused and they're not about to let the deficit stand in their way. They'll run right through the deficit and they say, oh, it'll pay for itself. Hand wave, hand wave, I'm going there. And Democrats are going, I have to pay for everything. I have to find a way. No, 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 you don't. They just gave you the freedom to now, right, open up. And so there's an interesting senator, his name is Brian Schatz. He's a senator from Hawaii. And he's got legislation out right now for debt-free college. So it's very similar to what Senator Sanders uh, was trying to do with public colleges and universities. And he goes and he sits down for an interview. And they said to him, debt-free college, huh? How are you gonna pay for it? And you know what he said? I'm not going to answer that question. He said, it's a trap. It's a trap. He said, the Republicans don't pay for anything. He said, why is it only progressive? Only the progressive agenda has to be paid for. I thought it was brilliant. And <laughs> what you're seeing is, I'm, I'm hearing from House members and from Senate staffers that the conversations are changing. In the background, they're all trying to figure, they write to me and say, you know, I'm talking with at least 20 candidates who are running right now. Uh, across the country for the House and Senate, mostly for the House, who are calling to say, how do I talk about the deficit? How do I avoid this kind of stuff? So I think we're getting there. I just think that really it's gonna take more of us giving them the space that they can then say, okay, you know, you're not gonna primary me and, and hold me accountable if I don't. Patricia, IMF, huh. Do, does it ever make sense to borrow from the IMF? Not if you can help it. <laughs> Not if you can help it because those IMF loans come with strings attached and the strings, well, they're designed to hang you. So um, I would, uh, but sometimes a country has debt. So the choice is do I default on this foreign denominated debt? I, I'm Russia, I'm Argentina, right? I borrowed US dollars. So now my commitment is to repay dollars, but I can't, I don't have the dollar uh, patent. So I don't issue the dollar. I gotta find the dollars. And if I can't earn them, then I need to get them from someone who has them. The IMF can arrange that loan, but it's gonna come with very ugly strings attached, right? So, um, well, I think I'd look at that on a case by case basis, but um, some countries have done just that. Russia defaulted, not just on the dollar denominated debt, but on some of its ruble debt, which was crazy. It could have paid all of that, right? What else? Uh, Anthony, basic income. So here's my thing. I am not categorically opposed to a basic income. I just don't know what people are really trying to do when they say basic income, because there are a thousand and one varieties of this thing. Sometimes people say, and some of, my, um, some of the people I know who are very wealthy say, we should just have a basic income and get rid of all other social programs. So Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, food stamps, uh, um, housing assistance, all that stuff goes away. And then we just send you a basic income, 30,000 a year. You figure out how to save for your retirement. You figure out how to get your health care. You figure out, right, and we'll send you a check and then you work all that other stuff out. So it, our pay for is eviscerating this social safety net. I think that is extraordinarily um, reckless. I think that replacing programs that have constituencies, lobbying groups, people who are prepared to stand to fight for, to defend those programs, swiping all of that away and replacing it with a promise of, of a check, free money if you like, the next Congress that comes in, what's the first thing they're gonna cut? The free money. 
the basic, it's going to be the first thing to go. It'll get whittled down until it's all gone. Meanwhile, you've compromised the safety net. Now, not everybody puts forward that. Some people say it's not a replacement for, it's a supplement to, and then I'm willing to, to talk about that. But yeah, I generally prefer the job guarantee because it aims the spending at the people who need it. It aims at the unemployed. I don't need a basic income check. And people who make more than I do certainly don't need a basic income. And so I, my worry, one worry I have, is does everybody know what this basic income is? You get a check, and you get a check, and you everybody gets a check. So $30,000. Well, if you're poor, you're going to eat right through your basic income. It's going to be gone. But if you're wealthy, you're going to take your 30000 and you're going to buy Apple stock or you're going to whatever. And so you're, what it does to wealth inequality concerns me a great deal because the poor are going to go right through it, consume the whole thing, the wealthy are going to invest, and then it's going to exacerbate already um, dangerous levels of inequality. So that's my concern. I'd like to <clears throat> take up what this gentleman started with. Um, you, there's a hierarchy of missions, and I think that you uh, rather neatly hopped over saying um, these are going to be sorted out and approved. I think there's a great question of power and politics in this, and how are you going to jump over that? You mean with respect to the job guarantee program? No. no. Oh. Generally, in your model. Okay. Note it down. You got it. <laughs> Thank you. He didn't trust me. <laughs> Josh, we can always talk anytime, but oh, I'm sorry. sorry we stop. talked at length. I know, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And I'll ask you one question because I forgot to ask you this afternoon, which is um, if the constraint is real resource, what's to stop an economy land grabbing? Uh, other countries' resources in order to expand the base at which you can spend money into. What do you mean, land grabbing other? I suppose if a policy was once known as Lebensraum, you need to acquire other people's territory in order to have money to spend into it. If your constraint is real resources, because you want to spend money buying stuff you have. Wait, what? Well, I'm, I'm missing the. Via what channel? Well, only if your currency area is defined by your national territory. You can buy things in anything that is denominated in pound sterling. Yeah. Why not expand the territory in which you can buy stuff in pound sterling and therefore become a more powerful and more... That's already an incentive. I mean, that's not, that's not Kelton. I don't think that follows from what I said. I think that uh, countries with imperial ambitions are already exercising their imperial ambitions. And I don't th think that it's um, carefully thought through in terms of... The, the currency itself, right? I mean, I think it's more about the resources. The drive is to acquire territories rich in natural resources and strategic, geopolitical, strategic locations. So I don't think it follows from what I've argued, but. So there's three minutes left, so you have yeah. one more question, then you'll answer okay. this question and that question. Okay. So Stephanie, first of all, apologies for coughing through your speech. Um, this is questions from my 13-year-old daughter. Um, she wants to know, because she, why can't somebody who's got a debt in a different currency just swap it for that current, swap their own currency for that one? She doesn't understand mechanics. I couldn't explain it to her because I, I don't, I don't really know. You, but I'm saying, like, you, you well, she needs it to from learn somewhere. Somebody has to buy it. Yeah, and swaptions. She could do that if she could engage in some derivatives markets and find somebody who wanted debt denominated in her currency. But, okay, let me, let me circle back. Yes, okay, priorities, look, it's already the case. Nothing I said, nothing I said isn't already the case. So what I'm suggesting is that we're not making full use of the powers that we have, right? There is more that we could do to expand fiscal policy, if you like, whether it's tax cuts for those who would most benefit or spending increases. But it's always the case that there are competing alternatives. You're going to have a constituency in the House who, you know, this group wants transportation because their um, state is, is really so in trouble. So how differently than how we do it now? Look, the, the way that I would 
suggest thinking about this is suppose you look, suppose somebody runs on an agenda to do these 12 things yeah? and wins the majority vote. Then you could say this person has, in effect, a mandate from the population. This is what the population has voted for. These are the things I want. Now it's up to the administration working through Congress to say how much of this agenda can we get done, right? But the priorities come out of the budgeting process and lots of voices get heard in that process and they don't always or even usually reflect the, the will of the majority. All right, that's macro and that's the, 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 the federal or the top government, but you have a local level which may not have these priorities at all. I'm not, so you're saying the local can stand in the way of the? Yes, I mean, um, the, the, uh, people have um, attitudes. Now, sure. And voter attitudes. And they're often at the completely, uh, they're often diff differ from what uh, yep. the top politicians or yep. um, even local um, politicians have. I mean, 68% of the British population, apparently, in polling, would not vote for Jeremy Corbyn, even though um, many of them don't like Theresa May. All right? So, how, how does one adjust what's at the top? And, and the Look, hierarchy of the all you can do is pass legislation. We did it in the U.S. with the uh, um, ACA, with the American Health Care, uh, so-called Obamacare, and that relied upon voluntary participation by the states. States had to expand Medicaid in order to fully participate in Obamacare. 20 states, 21 states did not do that. And so you weren't able to roll out health care reform in nearly half of the country because the states stood in the way. So that can happen. In the federal job guarantee that we're talking about, we're imagining what happens if you have a deep red state and you don't have buy-in. People don't want to participate in the federal job guarantee, but you have population of people who desperately want work, but there are blockades being put in the way through state and local governments, and our solution is uh, the federal government can directly employ those people, so you can end run. You can't always get away with that, um, but yeah, it's a legitimate question, and, and you can't resolve it in every case, but we're thinking about that with respect to the jobs. Yeah, terrific. Thank you, everybody.